Great, I can see people still coming in, but uh, let's make a start. Um, welcome everyone. I'm Bobby Duffy. I'm director at the Policy Institute at King's College London. And it's a real pleasure for me to be chairing this event uh, this evening to discuss John Penrose's report, Poverty Trapped, um, that pulls together a, a wide range of evidence, a very wide range of evidence, and, and focuses on what John describes as glass ceilings and narrow gates that still too many people uh, face. Uh, so we'll hear first from John, who is uh, the Conservative MP for Western Supermare, and among his very many other roles is Chair of the Conservative Policy Forum and sits on the party's uh, policy board. Um, then we really have a, a stellar panel um, to discuss the report from different perspectives. First up, we'll have Polly McKenzie, who is Chief Exec of uh, Demos. Um, then we'll go to Julian McRae, who's Director of Engage Britain. And finally, David Goodhart, who's a journalist, commentator, author, and the EHRC Board uh, Commissioner. Uh, and then we'll have plenty of time, I hope, for questions from you. And as always, you can sub submit those questions in the Q&A function. Do try to get them in early. Uh, if you can, so that we can sort through them and uh, it gives you a better chance of being uh, picked for your question. Uh, so we, we only have an hour for the session, um, so I'm not going to mess around. We're just going to pass straight over to John um, to get us started. John, over to you. Thank you very much, Bobby, and thank you very much for uh, introducing us and, and organising this. I'm, I'm looking forward to the discussion and the reactions, uh, both from my fellow panellists and also from uh, from the, the people joining us online as well. Um, look, the paper starts by asking, a, a, I think, a quite a fundamental but really important question, which is saying, look, in the last couple of decades, um, many of you know, the traditional uh, big social problems have, if not been completely solved, at least tamed. So mass unemployment in the UK hasn't been around for decades, and we devoutly hope it stays that way. Um, ditto, and I say this next one with my fingers firmly crossed, um, you know, high high inflation, largely tamed, conscious that interest rates went up again, uh, today, but nonetheless. Um, and yet, in spite of that huge progress in all sorts of other areas, and 70 years after the uh, both the NHS and the, the welfare state, more broadly the modern welfare state was founded, in spite of all that, uh, we still have levels of poverty which have been largely static for at least two decades and probably three or four decades. So what is it that we're doing wrong? Why have we managed to solve these other really big sort of social problems? Um, several of the, of the of beverages, five giants that he talked about when he wrote his report at the start of the modern uh, welfare state. Why have we managed to solve so many of these others, not all of them, but many of them, and yet poverty is still with us? What are we doing wrong? We're spending billions um, on the welfare state. Um, we are spending thousands, millions of man, man and woman hours um, on trying to fix this, and yet we aren't we aren't making progress. What do we need to do differently? And I think what uh, what worries me and what the my report suggests is that you know, we're fundamentally thinking about this in the wrong way. We are um, stuck in a mindset which has sort of been bequeathed to us by previous generations, which thinks of poverty as a sort of a, a relative income thing, where you know, the official definitions um, still baked into bits of our legislation are sixty percent of median income, for example. Um, and yet, really, really, that seems to drive us towards thinking of poverty um, as a, a, a treating the, the, the symptoms of poverty rather than treating the underlying causes. And the underlying causes, um, if, if you are a, a, a chaotic drug addict, for example, um, getting you to 60% of median income through the, uh, through, through the benefit system will fund your next fix, but it won't actually solve the reason why you're there in the first place. It won't create a sustainable answer to the to the, to the problem. So we need to think, I'm arguing, about you know, treating the underlying causes, not treating the symptoms. And my suggestion is that, uh, starting with a rather basic thought, that if people have the opportunity and the agency to get themselves out of poverty, if no, since nobody chooses to be poverty stricken, if you give people the, the chances to get themselves out, they will take them. The problem is, not that they don't want to be in poverty, that anybody wants to be in poverty, of course they don't. Uh, the question is, how do you get them into a position where they can get out of it? And so what I'm suggesting is two or three things. The first one is leveling up or equalizing up opportunity. And, and there we have a whole series of, uh, as, as Bobby was saying in his introduction, a whole series of uh, glass ceilings and narrow gates, which hold some people back. 
um, and make life much less equal in terms of the opportunities than it should be. And so this is arguing that the solution to, uh, to poverty is not through the benefit system, it's a social reforming agenda, it's a social reforming movement, a revolution that we need to have to look at some of these baked in causes about why um, your opportunities may be better than mine, why mine may, may be better than Bobby Duffy's, um, and say, what are we going to do to smash those glass ceilings and to do it fast? So that's step one, but that won't be enough on its own. It's essential, but it won't be enough on its own because not only do you have to equalize up opportunities, you also have to give people the agency, the ability to grab those opportunities when they um, come, when they um, sort of sail past their noses. So they take the life chances that we're going to try and create for them. And that means you have to equip people with the skills, with the education, with the attitudes, with the ambitions, um, in order to um, take those opportunities when they when they come past. And uh, the thing which is really striking is that those thing, those attitudes um, and those abilities, those skills, um, touch so many bits of our current state. They touch everything from um, the education system, not just schools, but actually lifelong learning, actually early years education and, and early interventions right the way through to adult. Uh, uh, adult uh, education as well, but also to do with um, our approach to uh, to ambition as well, and whether or not we are properly equipped to to aim high and to choose things that we are going to make us happy. Each of us will be happy for different reasons with different things, um, and not to judge those things particularly either. And that there's a there's a worrying, I think, uh, presumption in some parts of society, at least in some parts of the state, I should say. Um, that if you aren't trying to sort of maximize your income, then, then that is somehow a problem. Whereas I, I'm arguing that in a, in a, in a, in a sort of free society, people need to be, to be free to choose careers which are perhaps less well remunerated, but which they will find more satisfying, which will make them happier, which will make them uh, have a more fulfilled life. Um, and that if that's the right thing for them, they're much more likely to stay out of poverty if they're doing something that they find fulfilling. Um, than if they all, all ever, than if we all try to become you know merchant bankers or whatever it might be. So equipping people with those attitudes is crucial. And the final thing um, is to deal with life reverses. So these can happen to any of us, all of us at some point in our lives. Um, and for many of us, we are lucky enough to be resilient. We've been equipped properly um, earlier on in our lives to be resilient enough to be able to cope with life reverses, particularly if those life reverses aren't too big and too serious. But again, for any of us, if we are particularly unlucky, if we end up with um, a series of bad things that happen to us and through no fault of our own often, um, then we can end up uh, with, with, you know, with a life collapse effectively um, and end up being seriously addicted to drugs or, uh, or end up in prison or whatever it might be. And we need to have a, a rehabilitation um, system. Uh, re and I don't just mean they uh, rehabilitation from drugs, but rehabilitation for you know, getting you back into productive life, being able to live independently after a life collapse. Um, and that needs to be something which is much more systematic because for the small number of people for whom this really, really, um, who are completely on their uppers, who are completely upended by um, a series of uh, bad life events, um, it is hugely to their benefit, but it is also hugely to the state's benefit, it's hugely to society's benefit, and it's just morally right as well. Um, to try and get them back into being able to live independently if we can. So Bobby, it's those three, those three, uh, those, those three topics, if you like, uh, de destroying the, the, smashing the glass ceilings, equipping people with the agency to grab the opportunities once we've leveled them all up, and also for those of us who are the small minority of us who are unfortunate enough to suffer a life, a life collapse, and um, to be able to bounce back from that satisfactory. Those are sort of the three big headings. The report then has a whole series of um, specific proposals about how you might deliver on those um, and that's everything from a points-based honours system um, which I talked about with, with Polly at a demos event the other day through to major reforms to our education system to, to get rid of some of the inherent snobbery for example that currently makes um, further education um, too often not always but too often um, a sort of poor, uh, a sort of poor, uh, poor relation a uh, sort of Cinderella service compared to higher education that shouldn't be right that isn't right it shouldn't be so and a whole series of other proposals like that as well. Happy to talk about any of those um, in detail if we like, but the three big buckets, the three big topics are as I've just described. So I'm going to do something unusual for a politician, stop talking and hand over to my co-panelists 
to tell me where I've gone wrong. <laughs> thank you, John. That was uh, admirably succinct and uh, very, very clear. So thank you. That sets us up really good for uh, really well for um, uh, the discussion. And I'm going to come to you first, Polly, on your reflections on on those big ideas or or the specific uh, proposals that that John includes in the report. Thank you, Bobby, and and also thank you, John. I think lots of people, uh, particularly on the conservative side have a tendency to say that previous strategies to address poverty haven't worked, so we should just stop having any. And what I really like about this ambition uh, is that, you know, alongside others in the Conservative movement, you're actually really interested in thinking about what pathways out of poverty either once or repeatedly really look like. And I think that's um, really, really important. Um, I sort of want to ask a question which is either stupid or obvious which I think we need to address if we're thinking about tackling poverty, which is why does it matter at all? Why might we care about people being poor? Um, because, you know, it, it's, it, poverty is of course a different thing in the United Kingdom than it is on a global level. It doesn't mean it doesn't matter. And I think uh, it matters because being in poverty is a source in all sorts of ways of human misery. And if we're thinking about what you might want for a society or for individuals within that society, it is, um, and I'm with um, uh, Richard Layard and lots of other thinkers, Gus O'Donnell on this, that in, in, in essence, what we should be aiming for is to optimize the well-being of individuals and of society as a whole. And it's really clear that poverty is a massive driver of uh, human misery and also often a consequence of human misery in all sorts of ways. Um, and that's partly because, not because money makes you happy, but uh, because not having money is a source of essentially two problems. One is the obvious kind of denial or lack of access to essential things for a decent life or a fulfilled life that might be a decent housing that isn't cold or isn't uh, doesn't have dripping walls or, where your children can do their homework or you don't, you know, we could go on about those essentials from food to energy, absolutely. But it's also clear that poverty is also a source of a lack of status and a lack of power and a sense of having failed, which um, I think also needs to be addressed because simply worrying about the transfers of finance misses, I think, what uh, lots of people are, are missing out from when they uh, experience poverty or when um, when they are forced into poverty by uh, all sorts of circumstances. And it seems to me that if we want to tackle poverty, we should think about how do you improve access to the things that are essential for a fulfilled life and essential for well-being. And, and you might do that by helping people to have more money in their pockets. And I think that's incredibly important. And the, the pathway out of poverty through hard work is good, not just because good work can bring you uh, financial resources, but also because there's lots of ways in which work uh, returns some of that sense of status and power in a society, which is important to people. But I think we might also think about more than just work and how can you supplement work with uh, a benefit system but also essentially ensuring that people have access to the things that you need for a good life. And for me, the top of that absolutely is housing. You know, we have a essentially a Ponzi scheme of a housing market. It's not technically that. I've been told off by economists for describing it that way. But essentially where, because it's an asset, that money flows into that asset and money flows into that asset from around the world because the UK is a fantastic country and a wonderful place to keep your money. Um, and as a result, we have uh, this most essential uh, good or service or consumer benefit, which everybody needs for a good life, is out of the reach of far, far too many people. And, you know, everything else that you need for a good life, pretty much, if you think about food or consumer electronics or clothing, has come down in price over generations. And the cost of a decent place to live, the cost per square meter just goes up or at best, if you measure it in certain kind of clever ways, maybe it's static. 
but it's not coming down whilst everything else is. But we also think it need to think about other, other things that people need for a good life. I think part of it is what people talk about, kind of universal basic services. I'm not sure I like the framing because I don't really like universal basic income as a solution, but is making sure that actually access to both mainstream public services, the kind of the, uh, the treatment people need in order to recover from those life reverses that John is talking about, but also um, the support of the state for childcare, the support of the state for um, uh, children's social services, for helping people out of crisis is actually fundamentally important. But my final point is for us to think about the stuff that's kind of nothing to do with money that people need. And it's really clear that poverty correlates really closely with um, lower levels of social capital within communities, that the poorer you are, the less likely you are to know people who can, for example, help you find a job. The, the less likely you are to be volunteering. And we know that volunteering comes with all sorts of kind of well-being impacts. So I think we also think, need to think about that sense of kind of network poverty, of experiential poverty, of, of that, that well-being might come from things that don't actually ever end up on a kind of family balance sheet or even a government balance sheet. And we should think about building up communities, community relationships, and giving people access to the kind of opportunities to secure a purpose, meaning and even status in their lives and their neighborhoods and their communities and their families. And that doesn't mean you forget about the money, but it does mean that what you're aiming for is a kind of a set of well-being outcomes that are driven in part by the money you have in your pocket, in part by your ability to afford the stuff you need, but also in part by the meaning that you secure in your life. And if we're not thinking about all of those, I think we will um, fail to address essentially the consequences of poverty when it comes to um, human misery, which is the thing we should be trying to get rid of. Wow, that was brilliant. Um, that was uh, really excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Polly, for, for making those as well. It does put me in mind, we, we ran a seminar with uh, Michael Sandel a couple of weeks ago, and that, that, that broader conception of this being partly about humiliation and that lack of sense of status and connection um, is, is really important to to, to bear in mind as well as that, that you know thinking about what the end objective is here in much broader sense um thank you very much polly um so i'll, I'll go straight over to julian um julian great thanks bobby um and thanks john and polly indeed for um such great um material to uh, react to um i sort of started my career uh, a long while ago at the institute for fiscal studies uh, where i spent an awful lot of time modeling benefit systems and uh, poverty income distributions and all, all things like that. So the start of John's paper, I was really, ah, oh, right, we're into definitions. HBAI used to be uh, a different name for it back when I was young, but uh, you know, all of those things, we were very careful at IFS to always describe that as measures of inequality, never of poverty, uh, because it wasn't really a measure of uh, that. And it doesn't really correspond to how people in Britain actually use the term. Um, so in setting up Engage Britain, one of the things we did was start to, start to do some polling about what are the things that matter most to people in this country? What are the biggest challenges that they see facing the country? Having done quite a lot of work around poverty, I thought it was gonna be a sort of mid-ranking issue, not one of the key things that people were interested in. Uh, and to my surprise, when we did the polling on it, um, we actually came a really strong second. The thing that was in front of it was uh, access to health and care, which might not surprise people as the most important challenge facing the country. But opportunities for families living in poverty came a strong second. Um, and we were quite interested in why that was coming out of the polling, but polling tells you very little. It's just an instant snapshot reaction. Um, admittedly, done three polls in a row, it came out very similar to that over different time periods. Um, so we got together some discussion groups around the country. We got people discussing and talking about, well, what did they understand by poverty? And what were, they, what were they really concerned about? Why did they think we as a society should be doing something about that? And that was really, really interesting, really fascinating. And actually some people will already know the answers because they'll know the data on a lot of this. 
Um, the concept of poverty is a very tight one for the public. It is about very basic needs like shelter and food and housing. Um, you, if you ask the public, about 88% of the public will agree um, that people are in poverty if they haven't got enough to eat, uh, to afford to eat and live properly. Uh, if you make it a much more relative concept, um, they haven't got, uh, and they have enough for the things they really need, but they don't have enough for the things that most people take for granted. You get about 25% of the population will actually agree with that as being a definition of poverty. Um, and why was poverty coming out so strongly in our polling? It was very clear in the discussions around the country, very similar results everywhere we went. Um, it wasn't so much that people thought there were people in poverty, they accepted that poverty was there. What was making people really uncomfortable was this sense that poverty was increasing. So going back to a slightly different version of John's why we haven't got rid of poverty, it was there a sense that there were more people on the streets, um, street homelessness, there were more people using food banks, et cetera. And that felt profoundly uncomfortable for people uh, at the start of the 21st century. Um, so I think anyone who thinks that this is a set of policy issues that's confined to one part of the political spectrum or another, actually, I don't think that's true. I think there's a very wide range of people concerned about this in the country. Uh, and it comes out of some basic social instincts that we have about how we want to function as a society. Um, the second thing though that I, I really loved um, about John's paper and actually came through in how we're talking about and some more of Joseph Roundtree Foundation you've done, which indeed cited in John's paper, um, the, the frame of opportunity, giving people opportunity um, to get out of poverty. That is again, one of the hugely resonant things that people will talk about automatically. And they have particular meanings for that, uh, which we'll come back to a little bit later. But what I thought was really great about John's paper, it took that theme of opportunity and giving people opportunities and then started to apply it in the way that you need to do if you're really thinking about the type of social change uh, that's necessary here. One of my um, little, I'm not sure it's a secret, but as a civil servant, uh, I worked for Gordon Brown on his, um, his um, social mobility white paper in around 2009. And one of the things that was very obvious uh, coming from that starting point, and often some people take some quite structuralist um, approaches uh, to poverty, you have to tackle it on a range of fronts. Just one thing, one thing you're doing, and even if that thing is the redistribution of income, it's not going to get you down the route. It might get you to change a measure of poverty uh, and change that, but it's not actually getting to how people are living their lives and the, the, the things that they need in those lives. Um, and of course, that brought together a load of things. What I think John's done is take a notion of opportunity and actually thread it through those different elements like housing, like education, like the honor system. Um, some of the things about inheritance and inheritance tax are in there as well. Um, you know, really, really interesting policy proposals in each of those drawing off something that actually plays very strongly with the public. How do we give people the opportunities so they can form their own lives uh, and think about that? I think the two things I'd sort of say just now, I, there's loads of detail in those policies and we may go into a load of them in detail, but I'll just bore people senseless if I start talking in detail about each of the, each of the areas, but they're all really, really good, really interesting uh, things. A few of them, I think we could refine a little and uh, develop, but I think it's a really good starting point. The two things I'd just like to say towards the end, one of them's gonna echo a little bit, Polly, um, which is about community. Um, it is really important to understand the role communities play around poverty. Quite often poverty itself, particularly in its deepest forms and the forms the public really recognize, is around chaotic lifestyles, it's around communities that are very, very stretched. Often seen though, is sort of victim communities waiting for someone to come from outside to sort things out for them. If you look at the work that actually goes on and really makes a difference in people's lives in those circumstances, it is almost always something that is very rooted in those communities. It's people in those communities themselves assisting and helping each other. Uh, and there's an entire area of public policy that often gets dismissed by people with my kind of background from a big policy thing. It's too small scale, it's too, we can't replicate it. It doesn't make a difference uh, at that level. If you're talking about helping people who are really challenged in their lives, actually it's people coming alongside them. John talks about it a bit in the paper. Um, how do we help those community groups, those civic groups, interact, prosper, and really help people themselves and those communities helping themselves, not communities seen 
is areas that have to be helped from outside, but communities that are making a difference for themselves. Um, and the only other thing I want to just touch on before I finish is the notion of contribution. Um, I think, again, there's a huge amount in the way we've ended up with our structures and systems of the state that they underestimate the importance of people feeling they are making a contribution, even if they're in receipt of benefits or something along those lines. And indeed, of us as a society seeing that people are making a contribution. Um, it's really, really important. And means-tested systems um, that I've worked on many times in my life, designed by the Treasury to constrain money, um, tend to get very, very tight in why you get payments. They tend to take away agency. They tend to take away the ability of people to contribute and show they're contributing. Um, and that's one thing that I think, again, if you play this opportunity lens through and you play it out into how we structure some of our social welfare state, you actually get some really interesting points where it's possible to bring contribution back into the system. Uh, so I'll finish there because I'm conscious that I've covered a lot of ground and I'm sure I'm out of time. Uh, so I'll hand you back to Bobby. Yeah, and that was brilliant. Thank you again, Julian, to two great contributions. And yeah, that focus on contribution as, as an issue reflected in so much of our uh, research too. So um, thank you for that. Just a couple of heads up. Um, do put the cues, uh, questions in the Q&A if you are. We're, and then, John, I will come back to you before we go to the Q&A, um, just for any reflections on the panel's uh, responses. But uh, David, over to you first. Great, thanks. Uh, yeah, I, I have to admit, I was, in, I was very impressed by the extraordinary range and detail. It wasn't really um, what I was expecting, John. Um, it's kind of John Penrose's theory of everything. Um, theory of everything in public policy that he could think about. Um, um, I did think some of the ideas were, were slightly dotty, um, um, but many of them I thought were very, very insightful and original. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm going to, I think, just reflect very briefly on some of your thoughts about a higher education and further education. I think you're, you're there, um, you're kind of in the mainstream of, of current thinking in, in a sense, wanting to kind of row back from what many people, including me, regard as the overexpansion of higher education in, in recent years decades, which uh, amongst other things has produced two sets of, of rather disgruntled people. I mean, first of all, the people who are not in Tony Blair's 50%, um, um, and also quite a large proportion of those people who were in Tony Blair's 50%, who have discovered that, you know, five to 10 years after graduating, they're still not in a graduate job, the graduate income premium has, has almost disappeared for a lot of people who are not at the most elite universities. Um, and so on. Um, uh, and in the meantime, we have you know, a crisis of um, technical skills, the so-called missing middle, um, and we have a recruitment crisis in many care jobs. Uh, I mean, I think you know, not just this government, but previous governments in recent years have, have realized there's a problem here. Um, and we have had a whole set of new policies, um, some of them still quite rough around the edges, the apprenticeship levy, T-levels, life, lifetime learning guarantees is a newer one, more investment in FE colleges and so on. I mean, I think all of that is, is welcome and you, um, you seem to broadly go along with that. Um, um, one of your suggestions I think is a very good one, something, um, I mean, I think you know, the use of, um, well, the use of the internet in effect to create a, a sort of single document. I mean, it could exist physically too. I mean, a, you know, a black book, a blue book, a pink book, whatever you want to call it, that has all the data. I mean, it, it, it would be very easy to collect it. As well, and indeed, Germany has something like this for people, for school leavers who are, who are considering doing an apprenticeship. Um, uh, it, it has all the details of the outcomes for different kinds of apprenticeships, the likelihood of getting employment, what kind of pay you might expect, um, and so on. And there's no reason why that couldn't apply also to, uh, indeed, it could be included in the same publication. You could do the same thing with university courses. Uh, that would be extremely easy to do. And it's, in a, in a sense, it's just the kind of thing that the state should do. Um, I, mean, I, I mean, I would actually go even further than you in, in this respect. I mean, why do we have so many graduate-only jobs 
uh, graduate only professions. Um, I mean, I think one should consider, um, I mean, uh, essentially abolishing graduate only occupations, perhaps particularly in the in the public sector, except obviously where a particular technical expertise uh, is required that can only be uh, acquired through higher education. Um, and I mean, I think um, the, I'm, I'm not sure I go along with this idea of kind of trying to formally equalize all degree. I mean, virtually everybody who goes to university now gets a first or a two one. Um, and so, I mean, the only way of differentiating um, is through the, the university you've been to. Um, I mean, obviously a degree from Oxford or Cambridge um, is of higher value than a degree from, well, but with this probably applies to most courses, not necessarily, I don't know, sort of um, a video games course, they probably don't have that at Oxford and Cambridge, but, you know, the University of Hertfordshire um, history degree is not going to be of the same value as an Oxford or Cambridge degree. Um, and indeed, the current system is sort of is based on the on the kind of myth that they are the same. Um, I mean, it would be better to almost go the other way and sort of accept that there, are, there is this differentiation. Um, uh, but I mean, I think, yeah, I mean, your uh, I think our our, cons our concerns certainly overlap in the I, I think the um, the fact that we've kind of over allocated reward and esteem to to one form of of human aptitude, the kind of the analytical, intellectual, um, sort of exam passing skills. Um, uh, but, and there are, um, and there are things that we can do about that. I mean, I think particularly if you look at the care economy, um, you know, you want to raise the status of the public care economy. Um, and that's obviously partly about, about pay, making employment more attractive in those areas. Um, and, and giving it the same sort of status and prestige as um, as as professional jobs that are more um, that are sort of purely cognitively based. And obviously, many many care jobs are a combination of sort of head and heart, in uh, in my language. Um, but um, I think one one whole, one thing that's lacking in your analysis is the whole question of of family. I mean, if you know, that if you want to raise the status of of the public care economy. And I think you have, it's very difficult to do that without raising the status of the private care economy. Um, and you talk about childcare, um, you don't, um, you don't um, raise the possibility of paying people to look after their own children. I mean, we, we have the kind of rather bizarre situation in a way in which you, you can, you can, you can only get support for raising children if you hand your child over to a stranger to look after them many people uh, you know you were talking earlier about you know uh, uh, other forms of meaning um and um you know the, the private realm is an in, you know is the most important source of meaning for most people we are an outlier as a country both in terms of family breakdown uh, you know an enormous cause of misery and indeed poverty i'm sure um um, we're also an international outlier in the lack of support that we provide for young families you know, through the, particularly through the tax system. We don't allow people bringing up children together to share their tax allowances, or at least we do, but only a trivial amount. Um, tax levels are very high in France. If you're a couple bringing up children, you pay virtually no tax uh, unless you're a really high earner, um, because they do allow you to, to share your tax allowances. That's true of lots of lots of European countries. Um, so, um, you know, I think, you know, that helping to reduce the financial stress on, on young couples bringing up children um, would, I think, um, would, would, I think, um, you know, deal with, with quite a few of the, of the, of the balls you're, you're juggling um, um, on, on your, in your policy proposals. Um, Anyway, let me stop there. Brilliant. Thank you. Thanks, David. Good to delve into some of the specific issues in a bit more depth there. So um, I'm going to come back to you, John, just to have reflections on all those uh, very useful contributions. Anything you want to pick up? Thank you um, all for, for some very thought-provoking reactions. I, I just had some two, if I can, um, before we move on to questions. Um, the, the first one is where... Polly was talking about the, the fact that you know, there's, 
uh, I'm paraphrasing you inelegantly, but you were saying you know, there's more to life than money and other things matter too, anything from status on through. Um, and I, I was particularly struck by your points about housing costs having gone up and up and up when so many other costs, essential costs, um, have fallen. And, and I think that that's absolutely right. And it drives me to two, to two conclusions. Um, one is that part of the job of government in reducing poverty needs to be to say, how can we make more of those things affordable without necessarily subsidizing them? Because you know, Rishi Sunak's got very little money at the moment. He's, you know, the public finances are generationally at a tight point at the moment anyway. Um, but therefore reducing the cost of something like housing by my suggestion in, in, in the paper is a kind of two or three, I think quite big ideas to reduce to, to increase supply without concreting over green fields and so forth. Um, on the grounds that if we increase supply by enough in the right way, in the right areas, um, then you can genuinely reduce the costs very dramatically indeed. But the same point I think applies to and one of the other points that David was um, arriving at as well, which is this point about childcare as well. And, and the, you know, if you look at the costs of housing and the cost of childcare, those are two of the biggest glass ceilings that you're going to find. You know, the, the child, uh, uh, both of them mean that if you are if you are a working family, uh, it can interrupt your your. Uh, uh, here we are, childcare in action. There you go. Uh, uh, if you're a working family, um, it can mean that one or both parents need to put their career on hold. And certainly if you are a single parent, um, it is uh, a, a, a very difficult row to hoe. Um, and it particularly drives uh, um, gender pay imbalances at the same time, because it, um, that, that burden often even now falls disproportionately on women. Um, so reducing the costs of childcare to make it more affordable, rather than trying to subsidize your way out of it, making it just democratically um, a more affordable um, thing, which more more which is in, within the reach of more of us, is hugely important. Ditto housing, because otherwise geography becomes destiny for too many of us as well. So both those two things are absolutely um, essential, and I think it, that's the way to deal with some of the problems around status too. Because for many of us, um, status isn't a question of whether or not Bobby Duffy earns more money than me. Um, it is uh, because it may very well be that I have chosen to go into a career which um, is adequately paid, but is less well paid than him, but I'm doing it because I get other benefits from it. The, 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 the point, we all of us um, assess status differently. And, and certainly the research shows, I think, um, that if you just look at it as a function of the paycheck at the end of the week or the end of the month, um, then you're missing out on an enormous amount of things. Many of us choose to do things whether we work for an NGO, whether we work um, as, a, as, a, as a teacher or a nurse, um, rather than as a very, very highly paid corporate lawyer, which makes us happy and makes us fulfilled. Um, and that matters more to many of us. Otherwise, we wouldn't choose to do them. We wouldn't choose to take those jobs. And so that is thinking of people in the round, which I think was where Polly was, 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 was sort of leading us, um, is absolutely essential not least because it then accepts that people are more than just a paycheck um, and more than uh, they're worth more than their salary, um, but also because it means that we are accepting and understanding and baking into the sort of the core of the, you know, the future welfare state, perhaps, the notion that being able to chart your own course through life, self-determine where you, what, what makes you happy as opposed to your neighbor or the person you were at school with, that is at the bottom um, a, a recipe for more people being more happy in a society, according to the social research, um, but also it means that if you're doing something you love, um, you're much less likely to fall into poverty than if you're doing something you don't like for the same money. So it's, um, it, it, I think that those are sort of key insights and absolutely essential as a way of thinking about what a next generation welfare state and what a next generation good society might look like. Bobby, I shall stop there, and, uh, and we're happy to delve into the details of some yep. of the uh, some of the ideas uh, if we can. Yeah, thank you, John. Thank you. And just, I mean, picking up on that theme of childcare, this wasn't so much a question as a as a comment from someone submitted in advance from Rebecca Geach, which uh, said she really appreciated your question to the PM on the cost of childcare. Um, how she thinks that most many politicians don't realise how much of a struggle it is. Um, 
for everyone on that um, with uh, I have a meeting coming up with him in the new year so I shall, I shall, I shall report back on how that goes but uh, Great. He, was, he was interested enough to say he wanted to talk to me about it so. good good yeah it's coming up a lot in the types of comments from people about um and obviously from the panelists as well uh, focusing on that i guess i uh, let's start with a sort of big bigger picture about the kind of the underlying theory or or vision for this because it's come up a lot in the the question submitted so and it is about the welfare benefit system and and how that interacts with this and how we can ignore that so there's actually a re really nicely put together question from neil cowan who says what what impact do you and the panel think that benefit cuts since 2010 have played in increasing levels of poverty across uh, the UK and it's a, a useful analogy I think from Neil because he, he's he's saying that arguing in income inequality in income inequality is not useful as a lens through which to discuss poverty is akin to arguing that scoring goals are not useful lens through which to gauge the result of a football match um, which I think is a interesting way to think about the end point here and related to Polly's point about misery um, and what is the purpose here according to Neil, poverty is a fundamentally about a lack of income. Any attempt to shift the focus away from that is uh, misleading of the experience of poverty. Um, and it's actually, that's focusing on the symptoms rather than the drivers, rather than the other way around. And it would just be good to get reflections from you first, John, on, on that, that perspective, and then others too. So, I, mean, I, I think it's, I hope it's common ground um, right the way across the political spectrum, that, that low income is clearly vital. Uh, is it clearly a sort of uh, you know, one of the, the crucial things? It's a, it's a symptom, not a cause of poverty, but it is um, it, in the same way as goals in a football match are a symptom of which team is playing better. Um, it, it's the, it's you know, one of the crucial and most important symptoms of poverty. Fixing low income, treating treating the underlying causes so that you deal with the symptoms of you know, pursuing a disease metaphor, dealing with treating the disease. Um, that's a different thing. So you need to work out what's causing the low income and fixing that. And I gave the example earlier on of chaotic drug abuse, drug use, but it could be dozens of other things. It could be the fact that um, you were uh, you, you you were having a, a there was a family breakup going on when you were doing your exams, and therefore you left school with no qualifications and didn't get into tertiary education or whatever it might be. One hundred and one different reasons, which may be causing your low income, but therefore just trying to fix it by through the benefit system is not going to fix those underlying causes. And so therefore that's my point, that you, you, don't, you don't get a team, I keep on, I, I will torture the metaphor about the football match a little further if I can. You don't get a team to score more goals um, by, by just sort of you know, throwing the ball from the sidelines into the net. You get them to score more goals by teaching them how to play better football um, and, and, and working out how to beat the opposition team through better tactics. And that's where we've got to go to. So. It's low income as a symptom. How do you work out what the, what's driving that low income? But it isn't relative income, it's low income. Um, and that's the crucial thing. How do I drive up your income, Bobby, if you're in poverty, or my income if I'm in poverty? Not the fact that you are earning a bit more or less than me, which really matters here. And an enormous number of cases starting out by saying, well, what is it that, you know, what, what, are, what are the life opportunities, what are the life chances that you want to take, which gives you the best chance through your interests, through your skills, through your background, to fix your low income, the answer for you will be different from, from my answer, but both of them will work if we both get the, the agency, the ability, the skills, the attitudes in order to pursue those different routes out of poverty. Very good, very good. Any others, anyone else want to come in? Polly, maybe on your perspective. I, I think that the question is completely right, that, that poverty is not having enough money. That, I mean, that's just true. I, I simply, I would argue that I care about people not having money, not for its own reason, but because not having money has impacts on people's well-being and happiness. And I certainly agree that you can't fix that well-being problem without fixing the low income in the vast majority of circumstances exactly how you do that, whether you do that through the benefit system, through opportunity, through education, through uh, disability, that, that's a whole different kind of question. But it's a bit like, you know, in, in this, this debate about whether we should move to the kind of the key indicator of governmental success being kind of gross well-being as a replacement for GDP, lots of very sensible people say, well, what's the point? Because the two are really closely correlated. And 
that's true. And so if you have a GDP focused strategy, you, you know, you're going to end up increasing people's well-being up to a point, right? And if you have a well-being strategy, you're going to need to think about GDP as a kind of massive piece of the input there. The question is, at the margins, you might make some different choices if the one is your primary thing and the other is just a massive input versus the other way around. And my view is that you can end up with better policies with a better set of goals if you just rotate your targeting to think about well-being. But I certainly agree that if you pretend that well-being comes from, I don't know, just being terribly sensible and going to church and having a partner and living a 1950s style life and that nobody cares about, about money because you can just, you know, knit yourself some food. No. Right, like money massively, massively matters. It's just not in the end the, the core purpose. David. Well, yeah, I'm just gonna, I mean, I mean, as many people will know, I mean, one of the slightly awkward um, facts here is that um, well-being levels are lowest of all in the richest region of the country, which is London, um, which is a place is quite an interesting kind of angle on levelling up. I mean, <laughs> do we want to reduce the levels of well-being um, in all the other regions of the country you know, to, to give them, by giving them the same level of income as London? I mean, obviously that, that, that isn't necessary, but I mean, it is a kind of warning. Um, I mean, why are the levels of well-being so low in London? I mean, I guess commuting levels, I mean, unless you have a lot of money, um, um, you know, London is not a, a not a good place to live. However, for, I mean, if you're on the kind of middle or lower income, um, for many people, it, it it is it is pretty awful. It has, as I say, you know, cost of housing, commuting, and so on. Um, so, but I mean, it is a sort of uh, you know, there is a, a sort of often a trade off between uh, between well being and and wealth. Oh. Um, I just want to just one quick thought on this. Um, the measures issue is a huge one, and we get very into it. Um, one of the strongest arguments for Gordon Brown's approach from his advisors was always income is measurable, it's easy, and a welfare system can change it. So you can set up something in government, which essentially Brown did, and the Treasury, driving a set of policies across a 10-year time horizon. A lot of what we're talking about is actually an implementation problem as much as anything else. There's so many other domains that you would want to do stuff on. How would you measure that, know you were doing it, and get the political drive that has to work across multiple government departments simultaneously to do it? Interestingly, I think actually some of the devolved nations have the infrastructure that would allow them to do that more than the UK government in e under either party over the last 20, 30 years. So it's not just a measurement issue, it's how you can use those measurements to drive action that actually plays out in this. John, will you want to come back there or shall I move on? I just wanted to, to, to drop one thought here, which is um, I agree that uh, low income is a, is a really important, if not the most important um, measure of poverty, but it isn't poverty itself. The thing, the thing that's causing the low income is the poverty. And your version of poverty will be different than my version of poverty because the reasons why you're in low income, Bobby, will be different from the reasons why I'm in low income. And that's the really essential thing that we all have to sort of have front and center here, because otherwise you end up saying, well, the answer is to, to just give us all a bit more money through the benefit system in order to get us out of low income rather than fixing the underlying thing and making us independent in the first place. I, I, I believe that we will have got rid of poverty. We will have dealt with poverty in the same way as we have dealt with mass unemployment and with raging high inflation. Um, when the need for chunks of the benefit system in the welfare state has eroded and shriveled because it isn't needed anymore because people can live independently. That, that will be the, 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 the thing which shows that we've got more people out of low income in a sustainable way. And that's the point. It's, you know, low income is a, is, a, is a measure of poverty, but it isn't poverty itself. Thanks, John. So just, uh, just picking up on a theme that's cutting across a few of the questions and comments again, it's, it's more just to reflect on whether there's more to say from the report or you're thinking generally about uh, uh, pensioner poverty or people who are beyond working age, because we've had quite a lot of focus on 
um, work and opportunity as a, as a way through this for people. Do you, what's your what's your reflections when you're uh, past retirement age? So I, mean, I, I, you know, I represent a retirement town. Western Super Mayor is is, uh, is is full of very important, very very wonderful voters who are uh, who are uh, over the age of uh, claiming their pensions. Um, so that, that that's my point, which is that um, you, you you people will still be living very fulfilled lives. We hope they will be um, when they are past working age, and in fact, many of them will carry on working. Some of them will work as volunteers. Some of them will carry on working part time. Um, many of them will do it because, or, or they will, to, to, to pick up on some of the comments made by, um, I think, both Polly and David, um, some of them will, will, will help out with childcare for their children, for their grandchildren, to help their children out um, and, and allow them to carry on uh, you know, developing their careers at the same time. All of those things are ways for them to be full, ways for those pensioners to be fulfilled. Um, and some of them will be you know, not being done because they are income maximizing at all, because those pensioners say, well, I, you know, I personally, you know, they, they've reached their own conclusion about whatever the right level of income is for them, and providing it's over this sort of basic minimum level that we've just been talking about, that they, you know, they, they, will, they will have concluded that they can afford to do something else. And some of them will be working for income because they want, they fancy a bit more, but others of them will be doing things which are not paid, which are not income maximizing, because it makes them feel good, because it makes them um, fulfilled and, and this point about that contribution really matters to them and it matters to them in different different quantities than it might matter to their next door neighbors who are at the same age and same stage of life as well but that's fine you know we're a, we are a free society and each of them all of them in if they're doing these things will be out of poverty in different ways yeah yeah i agree i mean yeah it comes back to that sense of contribution um, and uh, an active role in uh, society. Um, any other reflections from the panel? So I've got to move on to another question, try and cram uh, one or two more in, maybe just one. Um, I did, because we have had a, quite a bit of a focus on uh, the, the broader support that you need uh, among communities in order to avoid these sorts of traps. And um, so the, there is a, a question from Mary Rose Gunn, which is, uh, what role do you think civil society has to play in this reading up of the levelling up challenge and if it does have a role how is government going to su support it in that or how should it support it and mary rose runs a, runs a very important ngo which which tries to facilitate that so, so um, she's absolutely you know, an expert in this area look um i think my, my the paper had to stop somewhere is it's 85 pages long so so I, I i could have carried on writing all sorts of other things and it would have turned into a sort of utterly turgid novel but it's absolutely right. And I think a couple of the other um, panel members made this same point that Mary Rose is making too, which is that um, the, there's a communitarian thing here, a, a community-based thing, which probably I could have added more on. I talk a little bit about relationships when it comes to early intervention, to equip people so that they can form the relationships which create the social capital, which will stand them in good stead throughout their lives. Um, and I also talk about trying to get uh, specific local communities with interventions to improve trust in the organs of the state where specific local communities distrust those organs of the state whichever whatever they may be whether it's the education system um, or the or the criminal justice system or the nhs or whatever it might be um, and lead people to avoid those organs of the state and therefore not to take the not to take or engage with the support that those organs can provide and in many cases you know that those things are vital but they aren't the whole picture. So I, I think it's a, it, it's probably one of the areas where, where this paper is lightest or where I could have added a whole lot more stuff about how you create the kinds of very, very local um, community self-writing and self-helping um, self um, organizations, um, which, which I, think, I think Julian was talking about um, specifically, but others have mentioned too. Um, it's absolutely essential that we can do that. Getting government to help that I think is always very, very hard for the reasons that Julian was talking about. It's, it's just really hard to scale. Local councils can be better at it. And I think oddly that the, that the pandemic has probably helped quite a lot in that because it's forced local councils to rely on and trust and accept help from local communities 
um, at much greater speed and with much less bureaucracy than they were before. And that has probably empowered some local communities in ways which wasn't happening so effectively before. Whether or not once the, the burning platform of a pandemic uh, has gone, that learning will, be, will, con will continue, I don't know. I fear it won't. I fear that we will go back to bureaucratic normality and it won't happen. Um, and so I think the long and the short answer to, to Mary, Mary Rose's um, question is, yes, it really matters. Um, and I, I'm not sure I've got a, a sort of one, you know, a snappy one, one sentence answer um, for the reasons that Julian was pointing out in his introduction. I don't think any government does this terribly well. Um, and I don't think that you know, most councils do it terribly well either with the perhaps the, the exemption, the exception of what's happened in the last 18 months. Yeah, Julian. I think there's, a, there's, there's an interesting contribution in the chat, uh, which notes that I think the panelists are all from the higher echelons of academic society or something roughly along those lines. I'm not quite sure what academic society is, but, no. yeah. Yeah. but I do think it's on the right tracks in some ways for particularly this end of the spectrum of how you come up with things. Um, actually, it's not. If There's loads of things going on in local communities already happening, loads of people who are doing really powerful and important things. And actually, they have some quite in good critiques of what are the things that get in their way, what are the things that really help that happen, and what's the type of social infrastructure, not state infrastructure, but social infrastructure that really helps grow such initiatives. And I think that is actually the, the heart. If, you want to, if you're interested in that, those sort of forms, then you've actually just got to let people tell you what the answers are. And then actually the big task is how do we get institutions, not just state institutions actually, and Mary Rose does a lot of this sort of stuff, but philanthropic institutions as well need to start listening. How do you actually move beyond the bureaucracy of these things to things that actually support people in society? So, so you have to really turn the system on its head if you're mm -hmm. going to do that sort of stuff, but it is actually essential. Um, so okay. working our way to it. I should probably ask Mary Rose to, to sort of write, write the missing chapter because there's a, there's a thing here about institutionalizing humility. Um, and I'm not sure I know how to do that. I'm not sure most institutions know how to do that either. Um, Mary I've Rose, just written a paper, John, called The Humble oh. Policy Maker. I'll send it to you. Please do. Um, but but I, th I think in order to make progress, we have to recognize that the drive to nationalize, to standardize, to remove human agency hmm. uh, in decision making is driven by a desire for justice and fairness and equity. So, hmm. and you have to accept that it, you know, it's not just sort of institutional malice that things are. Hmm. Oh, I would really like to do is just get the DWP in there to ruin everybody's lives. It's driven by really good motivations. Yeah. It's just that in the end, the state has an immense power to suck the life out of initiative and community and feeling and relationships. Mm. And so you, you have to find a way to build in uh, humility, flexibility, innovation. And it, in the end, it just has to come with devolution and decentralization as the commenter who criticized, criticized our uh, academic uh, society echelons blah 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 says it, it you you cannot do this in a standardized and perfect way and actually the the imperfections and the messiness of community-led interventions even though so julian said something earlier which is often it's poor relatively poor people sort of you know second and third decile people are best placed to help first decile people bottom decile people and from a certain point, that's just wrong, isn't it? You feel like, can't the rich people help here? What they, they, There's a sort of justice imperative against that. And yet, those interventions that help people most are ones that are locally based and often are dependent on people who are closer to it. And so you then think at the sort of macro level, how do you, how do you create a tax system that kind of picks up for some of that? You've got, you can't fix it by just taking money away from people, I'm afraid Gordon Brown style, in a perfect way, and designing the perfect system that looks great on a spreadsheet and reallocates the precise amount of money to the right people. In the end, human-led, community-led, messy, relationship-based services are the only ones that have much of a chance of succeeding. Excellent, I'm so glad we managed to get that, um, that level of discussion out. That's really, really great. So. Any final thoughts, John? We're just coming to the end now. We, oh, actually, we're one minute over. So any any final thoughts before we finish? I, I just want to read Polly's um, paper now. Um, so, so Polly, please send it to me. Yeah, that sounds absolutely brilliant. 
Great. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. That was a, a, a really excellent discussion. Thank you, everyone, for coming, all the attendees uh, for coming. Um, thank you to Policy Institute uh, team for putting this uh, together. Thanks to the panelists for uh, truly brilliant contributions to it, really enriching the conversation. And thank you, of course, to John and his team for uh, developing the paper, which uh, has started this conversation. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you all. Happy Christmas. <laughs>